Genesis chapter 1, verse 11 to 12. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding seed, fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And then over in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I will put enmity between thee, talking to the serpent, and the woman. Between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Let's pray. Father, I love you. Thank you for your people that are here this morning. God, open our eyes and our ears to your word this morning, what your Spirit's saying to the church. Bless us, Father, in Jesus' name. Everybody said, in Jesus' name. And look at somebody and said, I feel the need for seed. Amen. You may be seated. You know that saying, I have a, I feel the need, the need for speed. Uh, This is, I'm preaching this morning, teaching, whatever it is I'm going to do here for the next, well, how much time I got. You're in trouble today because I got about, what, I can't even see that blue clock back there. I can't even see the clock, so you really are in trouble this morning. A need for seed. My, grand, my grandson was over Wednesday. We celebrated my wife's birthday, had the family over. In fact, every Wednesday's family night, but we had other extended family members to celebrate her birthday. And I won't tell you how old she is, but if she wants to, she can tell you later on. And um, I w- had made enchiladas for dinner that night, and um, my famous enchiladas. In fact, someone told me how great they were. I said, I love your enchiladas. What's the recipe? Oh, I said, it's real easy. You go over there to that old El Paso empty can of enchilada sauce, and on the back it says cheesy, beefy enchiladas, and that's my recipe. <laughs> Which reminded me when I said it of my Grandpa Unger. My Grandpa Unger was famous for his chocolate fudge. Every Christmas he'd make chocolate fudge, and everybody would eat up, and he would, they would ask him, what's your recipe, doing for your chocolate fudge? And he would say, oh, it's an ancient Chinese secret. And it wasn't until after many, many years that my mom one day was looking at the back of the Hershey's cocoa can and saw the recipe right there on the cocoa can. That was his ancient Chinese, my Chinese secret for enchiladas is on the back of the old El Paso can. But I made some uh, avocado dip. Uh, take a little rotel, drain it, put it in a, in a, a, a bowl and then mix it with uh, three avocados. I got the seeds out and laid them to the side and my grandson came over and saw these huge avocado seeds, and he said, what is that, Opa? And I said, that is life. That contains life. And then for the next 30 minutes, he was preoccupied. He was digging into that thing, grabbing stuff, knives out, a knife out of the uh, drawer, trying to figure out and get inside of that seed so he could see what kind of life there was in there. But I want you to know that the seed has life in it this morning. Now, this life that the seed has can be for good or it can be for evil. And in the Old Old Testament, the book of Genesis chapter 1, when we have the creation of the world, the Lord creates these trees and these herb-yielding trees. And they're supposed to be fruitful and to multiply. In fact, the first commandment God gives, the first commandment He gave to man wasn't here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, although that is the first of the Ten Commandments. The first commandment we read in the Bible is when the Lord says to Adam, be fruitful and multiply. God is really interested in us being fruitful and to increase ourselves, to grow and to also have descendants and to keep a presence in the world. And so you know the story how that they were in the garden and the Lord told them you can keep the garden, Adam, and every tree in the garden you can eat except for the tree of a knowledge of good and of evil. And the Bible says the serpent came and spoke with Eve one day. And Eve, the Bible lets us know, was beguiled because the devil tricked her. He said, hath not God, has God said you can eat of the tree of a... Knowledge, she said, well, we can eat of every tree except this one tree. And that is how the devil operates. He wants you to focus not on everything that you have, but the one thing you may not have. 
he gets you sidetracked sometimes. I had a friend of mine, his name was Rodney Fouch. Rodney was serving God, and God had delivered him from, uh, he was a drug dealer at one time and, and was involved in the drug world, and the Lord had delivered him from all that, put his marriage back together. He and his wife were remarried. They were going to church. They were involved in the church. And he kept on ducking his head when I'd seen him, and I, and I didn't know why, but I knew there was something going on. So I went to him one day and said, Rodney, what's going on? He said, I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to stop coming to church, Brother Keenstone. I said, why? And he said, well, because, he said, I just can't stop smoking. And I just, I'm, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I'm just going to quit coming. I, I, and I don't have victory over this. I pray about it. I just can't seem to defeat it. I said, okay. I said, but before you decide to quit coming to the house of God, let's sit down and make a list. And so on the left side of the paper, we put down all the pros of what happened in his life since he had come to Jesus. God put his marriage back together. God restored his relationship with his children. God had uh, helped him get a good job. He was making more money now than he ever made before because he wasn't spending it on all, this, all, the, all the drugs and everything. And, and then I said, let's go on this right side. Now, what's, what, besides smoking, I wrote down smoking, what? What else is it that God is, what else is it that's in your life that's causing you trouble, that make you walk away from God? He said, well, there's nothing else. I said, well, then you're going to give up all this good stuff over here for this one thing you're having trouble with. Um, in our groups that we meet together on Thursday nights, there's a saying in this program that says that I'm a Christian that struggles with, and then you talk about what it is you're struggling with. Everybody struggles with something. Uh, I don't care what your, how, how good you look and how straight your tie is or how pretty your hair is. Everybody struggles with something. It doesn't have to be an addictive issue. It can be something else. But there is something that we're all struggling with. And so when we come to the house of God, we need to be very careful with one another. Because you don't know who's sitting beside you and what they've gone through, what they've had to endure, and what type of seed the enemy has trying to sow into their life, what kind of tear, what kind of, that's what they are, that's what the seeds are, they're tares. In fact, the Bible lets us know that there was a time Jesus gave a parable and there was a, an enemy came in and sowed tares in the field and, and the saying was, an enemy hath done this. That's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to sow tares into the wheat field of God's kingdom and he wants to destroy your life because the enemy's plan is simply to come to to kill, to steal, and to destroy from you. But the Bible, Jesus said, I have come that you might have life, and that more abundantly. And there is life this morning in the seed that God has given us. The seed is his word. We're born, the Bible says, of incorruptible seed. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. What fantastic and wonderful Advice. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Now, it's, it's hard sometimes to love everybody, ain't it? Uh, amen. I got some amen. It's hard sometimes. And sometimes you say, well, I love you, but oh, Lord, have mercy. And then it says to love them with a, a, unfe- with a love one with a pure heart <laughs> fervently. That's hard to do sometimes. Uh, people can be mean and cruel, and you're like, I got to love you? <laughs> And yet the Bible lets us know we're supposed to do that. And then it says, why? Because we're being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Why are we supposed to love each other fervently with a pure heart? Because we're born again. We have the spirit of Christ inside of us. It was Jesus Christ who at Calvary died for the sin of everybody at the same time, everybody individually at the same time. That's why we sing the song that says, when he was on the cross, when I was on his mind. I, you may not understand today, but the Lord loves you fervently with a pure heart. And so because we're born again, we're told to do that. But we're born again, of, in, of not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed. That's the word of God. The word of God is incorruptible this morning. So here is Eve, she's in the garden, the devil is talking to her, and she's listening. We don't know that it's the devil yet, it's only until we get to the book of Revelation that says that old serpent, the devil, we know then that it's that serpent that was the devil coming and speaking to Eve, beguiling her and tricking her, and evidently Adam had been a part of the conversation with God about 
not eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but uh, he had passed that information on to Eve. And so when the devil speaks to her, he says to her uh, what he says, and she says that uh, we're not supposed to eat it, neither touch it, lest we die. And the Lord never said you couldn't touch the tree, the fruit of the tree, but that gave the enemy an inroad because if he knows that you don't know the word of God, he can try to twist the word of God and to trick you this morning. That's why it's important for you every day to have a Bible reading plan and to, and to set, take some time aside and read the Bible, even if you read it for five minutes, even if you just read one scripture, as long as you're focused on that scripture and thinking about that passage and you put it in your thought for the whole day, it can feed you and help you grow because the Word of God is an incorruptible seed and it's full of nurturing power this morning. And it takes work to read the Word of God. That's one reason why we don't always like to be involved in those type of disciplines, Christian disciplines we call them, because it takes work, it takes effort, it takes time. I get up in the morning, I've overslept, well, what am I going to do? Well, I don't have time to read my Bible right now, so I'm going to get up and move around and, and get showered and get out of here. And I go through the whole day then, I haven't had time to read the Bible yet. Now it's time to go to bed and I'm just exhausted and I'm tired. I'll read my Bible in the morning. Before you know, before you know it, you've gone a whole week and you haven't really studied the Word of God at all. You haven't read the Word of God. It's not because you don't want to. It's just because it takes time. It's the same thing with prayer. Prayer takes effort. Prayer takes time. Yes, you could be in a prayerful state all day long, but there's something about setting aside a certain amount of time every day. I'm going to read my Bible and I'm going to pray. I'm going to talk with God and then I'm going to let God talk to me. Oftentimes my prayer is, is consistent of me speaking to Him, but when I stop long enough to let Him talk to me, and then he begins to speak to me through his word. I begin to find myself growing in God and being built up in the faith. Why? Because I'm allowing the incorruptible seed of the word of God to come into my life. And when he speaks to me, he speaks to me from his word that he has given me. And he said to, to Eve, he said, you're not going to die if you eat of this tree. And so he inserted a seed there into her because she believed it. There are both positive and negative seeds in life that you can hear and, and receive. The positive seed of the Word of God will help you grow and give you strength and bring victory. But the negative seed of the devil, the Bible says he's a liar and he's a murderer from the beginning. From the very beginning of time, he was a murderer. How is that possible? It's because he knew when he spoke to Adam and Eve that that word was true, that in the day that you eat of this tree, you're going to surely die. And he didn't care that they would die. He wanted to destroy them. You see, the devil is a fallen angel. You all know that. He is a fallen angel. And he took down, the Bible seems to let us know, that at least a third of the angels with him. And we don't really know what the number is. One, uh, one passage tells us that they are innumerable, the angels in heaven. How, how many innumerable that is, it's one third of those are on the devil's side, but he cannot expand his kingdom any more than that third, unless he can somehow get you and I to turn and rebel against God as well. And how he does that is he puts a seed, a thought in your mind that causes you to turn away from God, because the Bible says everybody's tempted when they're drawn away of their own lust or their own desires and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, it brings forth death. And that's what the devil wants for you today. He wants spiritual death in your life because he was a murderer from the beginning. And that's the seed that he's sowing. And that's the fruit of the seed that he's sowing. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You've got to be careful not to allow the tempter to tempt you in such a way that that seed, that lie, purchases in your heart and then brings forth your spiritual death. That's what happened with Eve and with Adam. Adam chose to disobey. Eve was beguiled and tricked. And the Lord, he was angry with the serpent. And he told that old devil, he said, I'm going to put enmity between you and between the woman between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. His seed, the serpent's seed, is death eventually. It's, it's all about that. It's about destruction. It's about killing, stealing, and destroying. But that seed that was in Eve was a seed of promise. And we need that seed today. We have a need for seed. And the seed is the word of God. But also the seed is the promise of the coming Savior 
a coming Redeemer. We're in the holiday season right now. Christmas time is coming, and uh, we celebrate it in December, even though many believe he was born in September, but we're going to celebrate it anyways, amen? In fact, Walmart likes to start celebrating in October now. I don't understand that at all. Uh, uh, it's all about the money, you know, but uh, I, go to, I go to Cracker Barrel, they've already got stuff out, and I haven't even finished getting the makeup off my grandkids because they went out and, act and looked like some scarecrow or something on them. But we're celebrating the Christmas seed. We're celebrating the time in which the seed of promise that was given to Eve was come to fruition in this man, Christ Jesus. The mediator between God and man, Christ Jesus. He was born the virgin. The Bible says when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. God brought that seed into reality. When God tells you that he's going to do something in your life, he is going to fulfill it. Uh, that seed of life that is in you, that's the seed of promise. He promises us that if we would put our hands in his hand, if we would give our life to him, that he will give us life more abundantly. That's the promise that he gives us. And he also says that, uh, are they all children? But in Isaac, he says, shall thy seed be called. He's talking to Abraham here. We are the children of Father Abraham, the seed of Abraham by faith. This seed passed down through the generations from Abraham to us, to Abraham's seed and to us. And Sarah, he said, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So evidently this seed was lodged, if you will, this idea germinated in the life of Sarah to the fact that when she brought forth that son, his name was Isaac. And Isaac was the one through which the promise was given. And then Jacob received the promise. And then Jacob's son come along, all 12 of them. And God's seed continued, the seed of promise that God is going to put an enmity between the serpent and between Eve's seed. And that seed this morning is Jesus Christ. He crushed the head of Satan at Calvary. The devil thought he bruised him. He thought he, would, he, thought he had destroyed him, thought he had killed him, but he had not. What he had done simply was to put himself in a position to be defeated. I don't know what you're going through this morning. I don't know what trials you're going through, what tribulations, but I know this, that when you trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean to your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him, God directs your path. And you can find out that even in the midst of great apparent defeat, God can bring out a victory in that defeat. And it looked like Jesus had been destroyed. It looked like he had lied because he said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll build it back up again. They thought he was talking about the temple in Jerusalem, but he was talking about his physical body. That's why the Bible says, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. That's not talking about praise there necessarily, although when we praise God, we draw God, people are drawn to him, no doubt about it. But the real meaning there is he had to be lifted up upon a cross at Calvary, just like that Old Testament sacrifices were lifted up upon the altar. Once he was lifted up, he draws all men everywhere to him. That's why we're here this morning in this auditorium worshiping and praising God because when he was upon the cross, he put into, uh, into a, a series of events here that bring us to this place now where we stand here worshiping, praising, and magnifying his mighty name. And his name is powerful this morning. There's no name like the name of Jesus. The Bible lets us know that neither is there salvation in any other, for there's another name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. This seed that was given to us, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, it is something that you can have this morning. When you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, you receive a portion of of that promise, of, of how great and wonderful He is. You receive the seed of life that comes from Him. And you become, one day you become what would be called a candidate for the resurrection of the saints. And the Bible lets us know that this mortal is going to take on immortality and this corruption is going to take on incorruption. Why? Because He has given us His Spirit that we did not deserve, but that He gave us anyways because He loves you. And if you have the Holy Ghost this morning, you have this promise in an earthen vessel, the promise of God's word, the promise that he gave and the promise that he kept. And this morning we have a need for the seed of God's word and we have this need today for God himself, Christ in you, the Bible said, the hope of glory. 
Galatians chapter 3. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not to seeds as of many, but as one. And to thy seed, which is Christ. Christ was a seed that was promised in the Old Testament. A messianic prophecy to thy seed where the promise is made. And this I say that the covenant... That was confirmed before God of God in Christ, the law, which was our was, was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. I hate getting older now with a smaller font Bible. It makes it harder to read. <laughs> if you're not old enough yet to have that problem, God bless you. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law. It was added added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by the angels in the hand of a mediator. God gave this law until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. The law of the Old Testament, Moses' law, if you will, the 613 commandments, what we call the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. These were the law that they lived by, but it was of effect only until the seed of promise came, and that seed is Jesus Christ. Now a mediator, it says here, is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is a law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given, for if there had been a law given which had, could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So the law itself could not bring life. It only brought death. It brought the death of that animal every year on the day of atonement, Yom Kippur. They had placed it upon a place of sacrifice, and it would be shed its blood there. They would take that blood, and they would take it and put it upon the mercy seat. And when they went into the room of the mercy seat, they would take with them the coals from that hot fire of repentance, and they would also take the incense, and they'd go into that room. And the Bible lets us know in the book of Leviticus, I think it is, that the, there God's presence would meet them, and they would, he would accept that sacrifice. But it was all about death, death, death. The Old Testament tabernacle and the temple was a bloody place, a place where it was gruesome and it was torn. It was all inspiring because of all the death that took place. But the purpose of it was to try to cover the sin of man by some means until Jesus Christ, the promised seed, would come. So it says, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. The law is not against the promises of God. The law was given until the law, until the promises of God could come into effect. But if the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promises by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. The promises of Jesus Christ are given to them that believe. When you believe, you're going to be baptized. When you believe, you're going to repent of your sins and be baptized. And the Bible says you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's what happens to believers. Because Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. That tells us that if you're a real believer in Jesus Christ, you're going to be baptized in his name. You're going to receive that experience of being water baptized. And then when you do that, we also know that God shall give you the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's the promise. And when you receive the promise, you receive his spirit inside of you. How many have the Holy Ghost this morning? You can raise your hand and say, I witness the fact I have the Holy Ghost down in my soul just like the Bible says. I've got the Holy Ghost. I received the promise of God. Uh, the Bible lets us know that the Holy Ghost is also a part of the promises of God. He said, go into Jerusalem till you be and do with power from on high. And he's going to give them power to become witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. This Holy Ghost that we have today, it is a part of the seed of God's word, the seed of his promise. When you speak a word of faith into somebody else's life on the street, you become a witness of the power of God, but you're also sowing a seed into somebody's life. Jesus told a parable 
in uh, Luke chapter 7, I believe it was. And then in Luke chapter 8, his disciples asked him, what does this parable mean? It was a sower that went out to sow seed. He sowed on different types of ground. And, and some produced good fruit and some did not. And so the Lord looked at them and he said, I'm going to tell you what the parable is. This is the parable. The seed is the word of God. The seed is the word of God this morning. The Bible lets us know in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the Word was God. The Word became flesh in John chapter 1, 14, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That Word, that seed Word, if you will, would come into, was personalized in the person of Jesus Christ. And there's nobody like Him. There'll be nobody like Him ever. He is the only one who can save and redeem and save our souls from hell this morning. And all you've got to do is simply believe upon Him and receive Him this morning. To pray and say, Jesus, I am sorry for what I've done. I commit not to do it again. That is repentance and He will forgive you. He will forgive you and He will let you go free this morning if you'll just call out to Him in honesty and say, Jesus, I want a change. I need a change. And I talked about how that we're Christians. Everybody in here is Christians struggling with something. That means that there are days that I have to say, Lord, you know, I messed up again. Please forgive me. I don't want to do that anymore. Please help me. How many have ever, oh, maybe I shouldn't, don't raise your hand. How many have ever either thought or said bad words at somebody in traffic? You don't have to raise your hand. No, don't put your hands down. <laughs> I've done that, okay? I have to repent about that. Do you know why I have to repent about that? Because I'm blaspheming somebody. When you blaspheme someone, you're talking bad about them. You don't know what's going on. They may have cut you off because they think they're special and they don't have to obey the laws. That's possible. That's what we think, ain't it? That's why we're a little irate. But maybe they're late for work. Maybe they're trying to get to a doctor's appointment. We just don't know. And so it's good for us to show a little bit of grace to people sometimes. Now, in my mind, nine times out of ten, they're just jerks, you know. But do you know I pulled out in front of somebody the other day, and they come by me, honked their horn, and, and they waved at me with one finger, and that was nice of them. And I wasn't in a hurry or anything. I just wasn't paying attention. And so I caused, I caused them to sin by my actions, inadvertently. And so we need to be very careful sometimes. But what I'm talking about is the need to repent. We all struggle with something. We fight things. Sometimes we are, I meet people all the time anymore. I deal with a lot of different people who are still struggling with the things of the past. They've been living for the Lord, some of them for a long time, but they're still stuck way back when they were children and somebody mistreated them. Somebody did wrong by them. Somebody abused them, perhaps. Um, in some cases, I, it's not a perhaps, it is so. I've seen it. And I've seen that their life has been derailed because of that. They're stuck in a moment in time in which they just can't seem to get past it. They look normal. They look mature and grown-up adults, but they still have in a cycle where they fall back. And it's all because way back a long time ago, somebody sowed a terrible seed in their life. And it's grown up into this situation now that they can't get control over it. And they want to. They want to be free from it. They try hard. And I come to tell you that I serve a Savior this morning that can help you through that. He can deliver you from the past. Not just the things that you did, but the things that others have done to you. Then Peter said to them, repent and be baptized. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Now, we focus a lot on the remission of my sins, right? The things I've done. That's what I'm being baptized for. But did you know that while you're being baptized, you're not just being baptized for your own sins? 
but you're also being baptized for all the sins that ever happened to you by other people? Have you ever thought of that? It's the remission of all, not only the sins that I've committed, but every evil action and deed that was ever done against me. Those things are being covered and remitted for and paid for as well when I take on his name in water baptism. And so if the Lord can cover that this morning, you can walk in victory. And it's good sometimes to come around and just chop down that tree that the devil's tried to put into your life, that seed that he's sown. He wants you to nourish it, nourish your bitterness, nourish your hurt. Take some miracle grow and put it on there and just keep on letting it grow. And, and then whenever something happens, well, you don't understand, this happened to me. And, and I got a right to be this way because of this particular thing. And, and I understand if we could sit here and tell stories. I could tell you stories of my own life of in the past when someone did something bad to me and I could have stayed in that place, in that position. But one day God delivered me. One day God freed my mind from that hurt and that wound. And I didn't think about it anymore except to tell people, I've been where you're at. I know what it's like to be abused and hurt and mistreated. And I also know what it's like for God to come in one day and said, Son, you don't have to carry this weight anymore. You don't have to carry that seed any longer. You can lay it down. That's what the Lord wants to do this morning for somebody. He wants you to lay aside the weight and the sin which just so easily beset you. Why does it easily beset you? Because there's still these hurts, these things you've been dealing with for a long time. Because the devil, he's so subtle in what he does. He comes in, he whispers, and he just sows a little seed. It might be a seed of doubt. It might be a seed of resentment. But he'll sow it, and then he'll nurture it. Something happened, and the voice will come and say, See, I told you. Look at that. Look how they're acting. That, I told you that was going to happen. And then you begin to water that thing, grow it until one day you overcome with all of it. And it's not just people in the world. It's people right here in this room today have been dealing with things for a long time. And the Lord's saying, I've come to pull out that tear and take care of it. To chop down that tree. The root's holy. But there's some things that got to be taken care of this morning. The root is Jesus Christ. He's the holy seed. The only seed you'll ever need is in Jesus. And so he said, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe and in time of temptation shall fall away. You have got to allow yourself to get rooted this morning and grounded in the truth. That's why it's good to come to church on a Sunday morning to the Bible class because you're getting rooted and you're getting grounded in the church and in the truth. You think, well, I'm, it's just a regular service. No, it's not. This is a training ground. This is a nursery where everybody comes. I'm not talking about a nursery for the babies. I'm talking about a, a greenhouse where you can come in here and begin to get worked on and let that that, that, that the great gardener of heaven work upon your life and your soul and tend to you so that that seed that he's planted in your life will grow up into a fruitful bush or a fruitful tree, a truthful plant so that God can see fruit that comes out of it. That's what he wants for you this morning. They are on a rock, which are they when they hear, receive the word with joy. These have no root, but which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. That's why you see people come and they go so quickly, and they come back, and they go so quickly, and they come back. They've never allowed themselves to get rooted in the word and in the truth. That which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. They, they bring forth fruit for a little bit, but then it does not, that word perfection is completeness. The fruit doesn't come to completeness. It doesn't come to a time of harvest because the cares of life and another place it says deceitfulness of riches get into people's thinking and their mind and they're not letting the seed do its complete work. The need for seed is that not only do we have Jesus but you, the Bible says, are a light. You're the salt of the earth and a light. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid and, and men see that light. They also know the seed that you produce. I can tell a lot about a person by the type of people that he spends his time with or her time with. 
uh, what, kind of, what kind of influence they are, by what kind of person they're with. Uh, some people spend time with people that are negative all the time. How many like spending time with a negative person? Every other word out of their mouth is something, I don't like that. I don't want to be around that kind of stuff. And I remember one time we were in the middle of a revival at the church, my home church, and there was a negative time. We had a year or two where we just weren't growing like we had. And some one day the pastor said, this is what I want you to do, man. When you're in your groups of people that you spend time with, I want you to talk about the positive things of God. Let them know, you know, what, didn't we have a great service on Sunday? And I'm so thankful so-and-so got baptized, and this one got the Holy Ghost, and, what, and this one was healed. And talk about the good things that God is doing. And so we, as a ministries on the staff, we begin doing that in our private conversations at dinner time. Somebody would bring up something negative, I'd automatically start talking about something positive. What, look what God is doing at the church. Look at how so-and-so received the Holy Ghost. And all those ministers on that staff did that, and they created an environment of positivity where God began to move. God can move in that kind of a position, but when there's negativity, it saps people, and it puts doubt in people's hearts and minds. I don't know why I got on that except to say, let's be positive. We don't have time. I'm so tired. I'm so tired of negativity. So tired of, how many have turned, uh, unplugged your social media at times? You just logged out and said, I'm not going back there for a while. Man, you felt so good about it. And then you went back, started watching it again, and all that junk come on there, all that negativity. And then you just, I got, why don't, you know, and sometimes I wonder, why do I keep a hold of social media? Just let it all go. It's not helping me any, and all the news on there is lies anyways. And, but it's a seed that's being sown into your heart, this negative seed. And if you continue to absorb that kind of seed, what kind of fruit is it going to produce? The Bible says there are those who are they're, they're so concerned about riches and the cares of life, and the worries and the struggles, but the word of God never comes, the fruit never comes to completion in their life because of that. And then he said, but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit and patience. That should be our prayer this morning. Lord, give me an honest and a good heart and help me to keep, to keep your word. An honest and good heart. That means you got to be honest with yourself. It's hard sometimes to be honest with ourselves. To know, yes, I struggle with this thing. To not hide behind a facade. You might be able to hide and put up a facade around me, around the pastor, around other members of the church. Maybe even your own spouse. I don't know how that's possible if you're close to your spouse because they know things about you. You're going to know about yourself sometimes. But if you could do that, that's possible. But you can't hide behind a no facade when Jesus Christ is around. You've got to learn to be honest with yourself and honest with him and just say, Lord, you know I can't do this. I've been struggling with this for so long now, and I'm tired of it. And the Lord's saying, listen, i got something better for you. It's the seed of promise. It's the seed of his word that he wants to plant deep down inside of you and produce good fruit, positive fruit, fruit that will grow and fruit that will remain. Back to Galatians chapter 3. The scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Before faith came, we were kept under the law shut up under the faith which should afterward be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. We needed the law. Another place, I believe it is, and I don't know if it's in this passage or not, but another place Paul says that our, 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 the law, it wasn't just our schoolmaster, but I wouldn't have known sin unless I had the law. It defined some things for us. And that's why we read the Word of God. We find in the Word of God a mirror that shows ourselves to ourselves. That's what Paul, or the writer in Hebrews, was saying, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, where he says, The Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints of the morrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The Word of God cuts through all that. 
cuts to the flesh. It gets right down to the center of your being, and it shows yourself to yourself. It discerns not just the thoughts, but also the intents of the heart. Have you ever done something and walked away and thought, well, now why did I do that? And where did that come from? And, and then you had to begin searching your heart and talking to Jesus and get that out of there because it came from someplace. And the Lord knows where it came from. And the Word of God will get to that. It will get to the center of what it is that's causing you to struggle with that area of your life. But after that faith is gone, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. We are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. When you were baptized in His name, you put on the robes of righteousness. And you put on Christ. You took on His name. And it says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to promise. God has given us a promise today. He gave it to Father Abraham, the father of faith. And that was transcended our physical limitations that we're not Jews here today. We're Gentiles. All of us, I think, are Gentiles. And, and so we have transcended that. The Bible, Peter said that in time past we're not a people, but now we are the people of God. Why? Because we obtained this promise by faith in what Abraham had done. And we are now the children of Christ because of that seed that was given that seed of promise that was given to Abraham and to Eve. Eve was promised, Eve in thy seed. Your seed's going to crush the head of this serpent. It's going to destroy that devil. And the Bible lets us know that Jesus destroyed all the works of the devil. Did you know this morning that you are fighting a defeated foe already? You don't have to fight him. He's already defeated. You just have to remind him that he's defeated. Uh, we used to sing another song that said, Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. He's already given you the victory this morning because you have been born again and you've received the seed of promise into your life. And then the idea of being fruitful. Be ye fruitful and multiply. When you're fruitful, that means you're going to have the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, Peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. And when you have that type of fruit, the seeds of love, the seeds of joy, the seeds of peace, they don't just bless your life, but they bless the life of those around you. Oh, it's not just enough that you succeed, but that others around you can also succeed and be blessed by the very fruit that God produces in your life. Now, the devil has fruit that he wants to produce in your life. He wants to somehow grow hell. Now, one man said that hell's having a revival. Yes, he is, but it's not a revival of growth because the angels themselves cannot procreate, so there's not more angels being created. How is he having that revival? By twisting the minds of men and women, putting a seed in them, that is a false seed and a false hope and a lie. But if you will come fully to Jesus, I'm going to lay aside these things that I've been fighting with and struggling with. I give them to you, Jesus. He can take that today. So I begin to make my clothes now. I think it's 1117 if I can read that clock correctly. I tell you this, and it's not easy to tell you this, but when I was seven years old, the babysitter came over one day and she said, started putting my hands all over her body, saying, this is what girls like. And it warped my mind for years. I had to struggle with this thing. Every time I'd get a sense of victory, the shame of that past would come back and haunt me. And so I was living in this cycle of shame I couldn't break. I don't even remember her name now, but I remember the day that God delivered me. When I began to forgive her for that, I understood the damage that was done. At seven, I didn't understand anything. But that day when God delivered me, it completely changed my life. The devil had wanted to sow a seed in my life to destroy me. Because the devil knew 
what maybe ahead of time, I don't know how, but he saw God's hand upon me. He knew that God had called me, was going to call me to be a minister of the gospel. See, at 10 years old, I felt God call me to the ministry. At 11 years old, I knew for sure that he called me. And so the devil knew if I could short-circuit this young man, if I could somehow put a seed in him that will hinder him, I can destroy him. But I've come to tell you today that the devil has come to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you have my life, and I have life, and that more abundantly. You do not have to struggle with your past this morning, with what's happened to you. I had to let her go. I had to forgive her. I had to move on. I had to grow. But I want to tell you today that God did the work. He made me whole because I trusted in him. And his seed in me began to do the healing work. And if you today need to be healed in your spirit, in your soul, or in your body, you've come to the right place. Because here the seed of the word of God is sown. Truth is preached and God's love is made manifest. And he will cover a multitude of sins and he will also heal you of the wounds and the hurts of your past if you will just trust him with it this morning. Now you might say, well, I have trusted him. I've asked him to help me time and again. I've given it to him, but it keeps on coming. I understand that too. All I say to you is just keep on coming to Jesus. Keep on putting it in his hands. Some of these things, they didn't happen overnight. It took time. And you've got to allow the master of heaven, the great gardener, to come into your life and prune you and work on you and get these things taken care of. Because we have a need for seed this morning. It's a seed of the word of God. And it's that word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That seed is Jesus Christ. And during this holiday season, during this Christmas time, don't forget the reason that we celebrate is because of that seed of promise that was given to Eve has now become personalized in that man, Christ Jesus. How many are thankful for Jesus this morning? Amen. Would you stand with me this morning?